but I never knew anything about what she was really going through. And I just knew about the, the, the attempts or whatever and still didn't know, you know, about how to help or whatever. So that's why I'm here today to help, right? Because I don't want anybody to, you know, to go without the education and knowledge, especially as families, right? You, you have family members that you're around every day and you don't even know the depth of, of what they're going through deep on, on the inside, right? The outside, they look fine. They laughing. They happy. That's just how she was. She was always happy. You would never suspect, expect anything or suspect anything either. And it's just, it's just a shame what, what we don't the know. views expressed by guests on the Living Chronic Faith podcast are not necessarily the views of Living Chronic Faith or of the host. This podcast does not constitute or replace medical advice. Please consult with your physician before altering your health care plan. Hello and welcome once again to the Living Chronic Faith Podcast. I'm Allie and I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today. She is a woman of faith. She is a mental health care provider. She is an entrepreneur. She is all the things and her name is Virginia Dale Manning and we're so happy to have her with us. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. I was delighted when you asked me to come and speak and be a part of your platform. I've been awesome. waiting for this day since the day uh, we connected, right? I have too. You've been such a, a just a beautiful person and just so um easy to connect with. And I've enjoyed speaking with you. And so I look forward to everyone hearing from you and what God has put on your heart to say. Will you tell us just a little bit about what you do and why you chose this career path? Of course. So, of course, as you said, I'm Virginia Dale Manning, and I've been a licensed professional counselor since 2011, also a licensed chemical dependency counselor. And um, I got started because, you know, this lady back here, I have like a point to her, my mother, you know, she had mental health issues and she completed well, she died by suicide. That's how they like to say it. They keep changing how to say it, right? So mm -hmm. she died by suicide in 1994. You know, and I was in my 20s and I didn't understand, you know, what she was going through with depression because she's gotten a real deep depression when her mom passed. And so as a child growing up with her and her depression, you know, I, we didn't know about that. I knew she took medications or whatever, and, but I never knew anything about what she was really going through. And I just knew about the, the, the attempts or whatever and still didn't know you know, about how to help or whatever. So that's why I'm here today to help, right? Because I don't want anybody to, you know, to go without the education and knowledge, especially as families, right? You you have family members that you're around every day and you don't even know the depth of, of what they're going through deep on, on the inside, right? The outside, they look fine. They laughing, they happy. That's just how she was. She was always happy. You would never suspect expect anything or suspect anything either. And it's just it's just a shame what, what we don't know. Yeah. And how we don't know how to, to know it. <laughs> so, yes. Mm -hmm. That's it. And, you know, the Bible even says, you know, that the people perish for lack of knowledge, right? Absolutely. And so I love your reason. I It makes so much sense now, your passion for what you do. And I'm excited for everyone just to hear the heart behind that. Um, specifically, and you mentioned not understanding kind of what she was going through and um, her not necessarily receiving the support that might have been beneficial to her. There was so much stigma uh, around counseling and therapy, especially, unfortunately, in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, people have been told, oh, just pray about it. When actually there's a real underlying mental health issue going on that can be addressed. Absolutely. What do you say to Christians who might need counseling support, but they hesitate because they're not sure how it aligns with their faith? Well, the thing about it is like, you can merge it, right? Mm -hmm. You can be faith-based and still get what you need from a therapist. And, you know, if you feel uncomfortable because you think the therapist is not in the, the church world, then you have an option. You can find a faith-based uh, therapist, right? There's options for that, which people don't think they have those options. But if you search for a therapist, you can request a faith-based therapist, you know? And then, and I know exactly what you're talking about because I'm a part of a congregation that says that a lot in service. And I, you know, I, I and I'll just be, I'm going to be real transparent. There's been times I've left the church that mm -hmm. I'm in now, but I know I need to be there because God keep guiding me back there for a reason because of that. I'm like, How? you don't even support my profession. And of course you always soliciting for tithes or whatever, but 
how I'm gonna tie it if you don't bless my profession, right? But that's a whole nother story, child. But I always say that, you know, God have you placed in places for a reason. I keep being led back to this church. I love the church. I love it. They, they teach awesomely about faith and everything, but it's just that one component. But what I have to say to that is that um, God ordained all of us in certain different areas, right? They ordained the pastor to, to, to reach the people, how they can reach them in the church. They ordained doctors to reach people, how they can reach them in the church. He ordained you to reach the people that you're supposed to reach in your area. And he ordained therapists to reach the people that we need to reach in our area, right? Because everybody's not comfortable going to everybody. What about the people that's not comfortable about going to church? Is it unfair that they can't be reached? It might be that one person, and it, it that does happen a lot to me as well. There's people who come to me who's uh stepped out of faith, question faith, or whatever. And, and of course, when they come to my office, they know who I am because they see it everywhere. They see the scriptures, they see this back here, they see everything. But how I like to operate because I don't want to push you away any further. I respect people who don't practice the way I practice because mm -hmm. I, I, the other layers I want you to get your mental health taken care of on top of the faith part but when they come to me and I don't push it I just wait for them to open the door as soon as they mention something about God faith or whatever I'm going in that's how I merge it now I respect I it, it if you don't and if you don't believe in that way I got to respect it but God just got me here for that reason as well to help you with your mental health absolutely you know, and I, I love the fact that you said that there is a balance that you respect those who don't necessarily practice faith the way you do, uh, but that they know who you are coming mm -hmm. in the door. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes one of my favorite quotes that I share a lot is preach always and when necessary, use words, mm -hmm. right? That the biggest sermon that we will ever preach is our life, mm -hmm. is the way that we interact with people. And so even though they may not hear a scripture quoted, they've seen a scripture lived in the way that you interact with them. And I think that that's part of just letting our light shine mm -hmm. so that people will see God in us and at work through us. And I love that approach. I think one of the things that kind of is off-putting for people about counseling and therapy is that we tend to think immediately of the extreme cases, mm -hmm. like the things that we see on the Lifetime movies or on the news. Yeah. And it's not all that. Counseling is not just for people who are in crisis. Will you talk just a little bit about some of the reasons uh, to start therapy? Right. So here at um, Gen Man Consulting, which is what my mental health practice is, my motto is to help people overcome life's common challenges. Mm -hmm. And people probably don't catch on to that all the time, that common challenges part, because for the most part, a lot of our mental health stressors or symptoms are common. All of us have it. And I want people to feel comfortable with that. That's why I make sure I keep that word common in there, because I want you to know, first of all, you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it's something that's, you know, it's, it's not, I can't for lack of a better word, normal, you know what I'm saying? But in a sense, it, it kind of is normal because it's life. Life situations about situational things. And all of us have life situations that, you know, aren't always favorable yeah. or that brings us, you know, sometimes we get sad and sometimes we get anxious, but you have to recognize that just because you have those symptoms don't mean that you, you know, that stigma, that quote unquote crazy as mm -hmm. they like to use. And I tell people all the time, first of all, you know, it's different levels, right? It's different levels of care and it's different levels of severity of those symptoms. So the key is to catch your symptoms when they're low level. Mm -hmm. That way they don't increase, you know, to a degree that's so high that you feel like it's so severe. Because a mm -hmm. lot of times those life situations, they'll have you spinning around and spinning around and you don't even try to get a grasp on it. And before you know it, it's snowballed and escalated so much that you do feel like you have a severe mental health issue. And okay. I tell my people all the time. So if you feel like you got this severe mental health issue, what they say to do um, about how you eat an elephant. One bite at a time. <laughs> Absolutely. And you so can add it one word at a time, right? That's right. Put that word in that one word at a time. So good. It is so good. And I think that um, people kind of get inside their heads sometimes 
uh, one thing that I've seen a lot of is people will have, like you said, a common issue, right? Mm -hmm. And they're trying so hard to deal with it themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of getting on that hamster wheel. I say to people all the time, it's like you're on a hamster wheel on a treadmill on the back of a moving truck, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no kind of getting off of it. And sometimes the issue is the people that are around you that you would normally talk to about your issues, maybe people involved in what's stressing you out. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. who do you go to? And so it's not necessarily that you have to have a mental health diagnosis to get counseling. Sometimes it's just, you just need to offload some of that stuff that's on your mind, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to just talk through some issues that are going on with you in a safe space where you're not feeling judged and you're not feeling like somebody's going to hold this against you or hold it over your head later on. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's so valuable. You talked a little bit about depression and anxiety and we hear some of these terms thrown around so much. And I think we get desensitized to them that sometimes I'm concerned people just brush it off when people mention it. I do. But the truth is depression and anxiety can be very serious, but it's not always clinical. Mm -hmm. everybody can experience and everybody does to some degree experience depression and anxiety but you know we have that kind of don't claim it mentality sometimes can you talk just a little bit about the difference between situational depression anxiety and clinical so situational as you said was a lot to do with life challenges right um, I'm in a toxic relationship and relationships I tell people all the time relationships are personal like intimate relationships relationships is at work people have issues at work that's a relationship people have issues with their friends that's a relationship people have issues at the per with the person at the grocery store that's a relationship so anytime you come into some interaction with somebody that's a relationship and you have to recognize when relationships are nurturing you or not nurturing you mm. and that's that that's kind of part of that situational thing is it my my um boss at work is that person toxic are they um well, some workplace bullying going on are they keeping me from promotions am i taking on too much of a low do i not know how to step away and take care of myself mm. so sometimes it's, it's just i'm not as simple you know i want to make it seem like it's you know so easy but sometimes it's just as simple as walking away and taking care of you. You know, that speaks to one of the big issues that I've noticed so much lately is the issue around people struggling to put healthy boundaries in place. Mm -hmm. And this can lead to everything from regret to frustration, to anger, to burnout. Talk to us a little bit about the importance of setting and maintaining healthy boundaries. What does that look like? When is a boundary appropriate and how do you do it? For some reason that topic has been hot, boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just finished talking with my, one of my interns and she was talking about um, what is it going on in the colleges where they protest oh, the protest yeah yeah and she was asking me well how do you deal with that and how do you because she I think she has a child in a college somewhere but then she also um, provides therapy for children and I guess that's one of the issues they've been talking to her about but I told her you have to set boundaries right you have to not let everything consume you and that mean like whatever is going on in the world, yeah, some people do have interests in those types of things, right? And everybody don't. And if you don't, that's fine. That's a part of your boundary. Your boundary should be whatever is going on in the world. First of all, it's not part of my goals. And if it's not nurturing me, I have to set a boundary for it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to consume everything because everything is going on especially if it's not nurturing me and it's not nurturing my goals. And that's a part of setting boundaries. That's even going back to uh, relationships. If the person I'm around, it up, family, friends, significant other, sister, brother, whoever, kids, if they're not, whatever they bring into me is not nurturing me, is not supporting my goals, then I have to set a boundary with them. That don't mean I have to never, ever, ever talk to you. That just means certain things that you bring to me, I have to block them off and not deal with you during those certain situations. The only time I want to deal with you, if it's something that's nurturing and something that's going to be prosperous and bringing good fruit to my, to my area. And you have mm -hmm. the right to do that. A lot of people think they don't have the right to do that. Like, how can I do that? That's being selfish. No, that's not. That's self-care. 
And it goes, because I think one of your other questions too, it goes to um that selfish and that self-care is like you're not trying to let it's helping both of us. So if I set boundaries so that the only time we around each other is when it's nurturing, that's not selfish because it's helping me and you. Because I'm setting those limits to where the only time we around each other, when we around each other, it's nice, it's pleasant, we enjoy each other versus me being around you all the time and then it's toxic. So mm -hmm. me setting boundaries is really helping you too. That's not selfish. No, it's not. You absolutely cannot pour from an empty cup. And if you're around people who are draining your energy, who are taking away from you and just taxing you in all kinds of ways, one of my uh, tells is if after the conversation with certain people, I'm always tired, always exhausted and just want to go lay down and do nothing, that lets me know I may be spending too much time mm -hmm. engaging with that person. Absolutely. And it's okay to put limits. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Because you know, if it's, especially if it's people you're around all the time, like family or whatever, you know from either the first word they're about to say either their facial expressions, their body language, you already know how the conversation is about to go. Mm -hmm. So why you have to sit in it? That's your cue. Oh, hey, I had a great time. You know, I got to go home and take a bath, get ready for work, whatever it is you need to do to exit or get off the phone too. You can do it with a phone call. Mm -hmm. Hey, I, I got to go to get ready for work or whatever. As soon as you know that conversation about to go the way you don't want it to go, remove yourself. That is such a a good piece of advice, one that I don't think is given often enough because we kind of feel so much guilt around, like you said, setting those boundaries. And we understand that that other person may not understand our reason for it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we feel obligated to explain mm -mm. or we feel obligated to, well, let me just give them a few minutes and hear them out. And we absolutely are not obligated to do that. What we are required to do is be good stewards of everything that God gave us. Mm -hmm. And that includes our time, that includes our energy, that includes our mental health. Absolutely. Just imagine, like you said, sometimes when after you finish engaging with people, you just feel like going to lay down and don't want to be bothered. You know how much time that's taken from you from meditating on your word and studying the Bible or just being at peace and being able to listen to him, to what he's telling you because your mind is so flustered and so frustrated? Mm. That's not being a good steward of your time for sure. And how would we, if we had to stand before God and he said, why did you invest so much time in something that you knew was taken away from what I gave you to do? Absolutely. I don't want to have to answer that question. Yeah, you can't. How can you answer it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good perspective on that. That's uh, good. Thank you. Um, that kind of goes into something else that I want to talk about. That's real trendy. We have all these buzzwords. Like you said, the boundaries is a hot topic. We hear a lot about trauma mm -hmm. and triggers. And again, I feel like some people have used this so much that when people hear that word, they just brush it off. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't even stand out to them anymore because they think, oh, everybody's talking about that. But trauma and triggers are very real. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to deal with someone who has trauma um, how it affects people and how to safely navigate those triggers and be a safe space for that person. So a lot of time traumas come from, especially if you're an adult, some kind of deep rooted childhood hurt or something like that, right? Either you were abused physically, emotionally, sexually, whatever it may be. A lot of times that's where the trauma comes from, right? Some past something, something that's uh, presenting itself in your now which is which leads to the triggers mm -hmm. so if you have some deep-rooted hurt or some deep-rooted you know abuse or whatever that you haven't processed or dealt with it will manifest in the now and a lot of the adults don't recognize that a lot of those come to me and i'm like well tell me a little bit about your childhood mm -hmm. because people think because it happened so so long ago that it's not affecting my now and it's not mm -hmm. triggering me now mm -hmm. but it is and it's not that exact act because as a kid whoever did it just for example maybe a stepfather you know physically abused you and but you're not around him anymore right you haven't been around him for 10 20 years or whatever so mm -hmm. people don't relate that that situation has a lot to do with me today but when you hear his name when you see somebody that look like him 
when you go to your mama's house where he used to live, when you see his favorite color, whatever it may be, triggers. triggers. And it bring all that 10, 20 years ago stuff back into your mind because the thing about the brain, it, it does its job. It's going to recall yes. whatever it want to recall, no matter how long ago it was. And mm -hmm. people have problems with relating that trauma and that trigger because they think it was so long ago. There's no way in the world that that stuff from back then, I've been dealt with it. I forgot about it. It's no longer bothering me. Yes, it is. A lot of times it is. So, but the, with the triggers is first of all, you have to, you know, be free enough to identify them and to, to be comfortable with that is what it is. Yeah. And a lot of people don't want to face that. That is what it is. And I tell people, you can't fix what you don't recognize. Because you might've been doing a lot of work and you might've been doing a lot of fixing, but if you haven't been fixing the right thing, Mm. that's why you feel like you didn't you're not getting anywhere because you've been working on the wrong thing that's good that's so you good. have to be truthful and transparent about what's really happening because that's the only way you're gonna get a real result wow that's so good i we think i say the truth will set you free <laughs> and it will oh, it will <laughs> <laughs> i think it's important too to talk about the fact that there are so many uh, types of traumatic situations, um, things sometimes that we don't even, like you said, recognize to be traumatic, um, things that we think maybe didn't affect us. For example, you can observe something take place and be traumatized by it. You can hear somebody talk about something in detail and experience some level of trauma. And just because it didn't happen directly to you doesn't mean that it didn't affect you. Absolutely. And that trauma can get stored in the brain. And then, like you said, the somebody's favorite color mm -hmm. can instantly remind you of that person, of a situation. It can be a smell. It mm -hmm. can be, like you said, hearing a name. Mm -hmm. And all those different things are important. So we can't necessarily know everybody's triggers, mm -hmm. right? But how can we be more sensitive to one another with the understanding that Everybody may potentially have some sort of trigger. How do we navigate that carefully? Well, it's about um, being aware, mm -hmm. right? Awareness and being able to just sit back and analyze, you know, do either a self-assessment because that's what that's what's going to take you assessing yourself. Like, how did I handle this person? Why were they acting like this? What did I do to make this person act like this? Or was it something I said or did or whatever? So that way, when you navigate being around that person, you could be more aware of the possibilities of whatever you did to affect that person. Yeah. And possibly have a conversation with that person. Not in a way to, to criticize them or to say, hey, you have to change or, or this has to happen or that ha has to happen, but just a part of awareness. That's good. Uh, a lot of people, um, as we've said, may not recognize that something is a trigger for them, but you may notice it in your conversation with that person. And it's so important to not internalize that and take on guilt for something that you didn't know was there. Mm -hmm. But like you said, just to be mindful going forward, maybe even to you know, encourage that person to look at what's going on and mm -hmm. just share your observation with them. And then, of course, even though that first time, you know, wasn't your fault, let's not trample all over people's triggers, right? Mm -hmm. Just be respectful of that and just be aware that the way that we address people is something that we are in control of. Mm -hmm. And so we can be kind and gentle and loving towards everybody. Right. Be passionate and speak to people the way you want to be spoken to. Right. And then, then it goes back to just um, being, letting people know what you see, right? In a respectful type of way. Because sometimes people don't even know. They just been doing it for so long and yeah. it's been so automatic that they, first of all, think it's normal. Mm. And so just to plant that seed yeah. of awareness and then what, what they do with it is on them, right? But you have to do diligence as a steward of God, right? To plant seeds in people that will help them grow. Now, if they be obedient with God and use that seed and water it to make it grow, that's between them and God. But you have to do your part. Mm -hmm. You can't make people do certain things or, hey, I told you this and you still not working on it. You doing this and you doing it. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to plant that seed of awareness mm -hmm. 
and then let God do his part. You do your That's part right. and you let God do his part with that person. One plants, one waters, God gives the increase. Exactly. That's scriptural there, <laughs> sis. I like that. <laughs> so a lot of times people are hesitant to suggest getting mental health support or some people are hesitant to go because they have no idea what it's like. You know, we've seen the people laying on the couch on TV, but we don't really know what happens. So for those who haven't been, how does therapy work? And as a licensed counselor, what are your goals when you're seeing a new client? What's your process and how do you decide how to approach that treatment? Well, first of all, I like individualized treatment. So what I do for one person, even if the issue is kind of basically the same, mm -hmm. they probably won't get the same conversation and the same treatment because I go off of what your needs are. And so once you kind of recognize what a person's needs are, well, let me back up a little bit. Now, finding a therapist that's comfortable for you, you have the choice to pick a therapist that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. People are always like, oh, I tried this therapist. I didn't like it. So they never try therapy again. Or they hear a friend say, oh, I had this therapist and, you know, this and that happened. <clears throat> First of all, everybody not for everybody. That's right. That's the reality of it, right? I'm not for everybody. And I tell people distinctly, I'm not for everybody. First of all, I like to be real with it, okay? I'm going to tell you what, what the real world has going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything because I, I do it respectfully, right? But I'm not, I would be remiss of my duties if I don't tell you what's really happening. Because like I said earlier, if you don't know what's really happening, you can't really fix it. Right. I don't want you coming to me saying, you know, this lady gave me these suggestions and they didn't work. And then one of the problems would be because I didn't address the real problem. Yeah. But I like for people to be comfortable with me. Right. So sometimes we have conversations. You don't even really think I'm doing therapy because we have conversations like, you know, we friends or whatever. I want you to be comfortable. And but at the same time, I'm tuning in to information that I need to give you what you need. Mm hmm. So you can you can advocate for the therapist that you want. Um, some people have insurance. Some people go through EAP. Some people pay cash. However it is, you can research your um therapist. Some people want an African American woman. Some people want an African American man. Some people want a faith based person. Somebody. Some people want somebody to do CBT. Some people want a Caucasian man. Somebody wants somebody on this end of town or that end of town. You have the right to have the therapist that fits you because at the end of the day. I tell people all the time, I don't have a problem if you, you know, if you, if I'm not the one for you, because I want you to get what you need. And mm -hmm. if I'm not the one, then I'm fine with it. And if you're not the right fit for that person, it's going to be an uphill battle anyway. Absolutely. I like turn people around as well. Like, I don't like the aggression. I don't like for you to, you know, come at me with your anger. It's okay to be angry, but don't come, you know, lashing out at me, trying to disrespect me. Cause that's what we're not going to do. Right? Because I'm here to help you. I don't mind you being angry, but yeah. don't, you know, be disrespectful to me and lash out with me, which I don't get many of them, but there have been a few that I have gotten, you know, that most of them are like forced to come to therapy. So, you mm -hmm. know, I really don't want to be here. So they're going to give you a hard time anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I tell the refer referral source, I'm sorry, you're going to have to get them to somebody else. Yeah. And I'm like here to that. help you. Right. And I like that no nonsense approach. You know exactly what you're getting when you get it. Mm -hmm. And there's no question about, you know, how this is going to work. And I think that that helps. Again, you're setting your boundaries, gives other people permission to set boundaries as well. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. So you shared a little bit with us about how you engage your faith in your practice, but tell us about what Bible verse encourages you when you get overwhelmed, because everybody you know, gets overwhelmed at some point. Everybody has common challenges. Tell us about a verse that encourages you. Oh, I have so many of them. I could just look at them. They all kind of, some of them like pen right here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you need strength, always say a prayer. What is Philippians 4.13? I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I just have it all just all, every time I turn my face, it's going to be something that I see that's scriptural. From my church, I have, I don't know if you can see it, but it's like, I am faith declaration. So every time I start feeling some type of way, type of way, I am successful. I am blessed. I am happy. I am an overcomer. So these are just some I am faith 
biblical declarations that come from the Bible. But I really do love the one that really, the very, very first one, when I was younger, you know, many years ago and really going through something is I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was when I was first trying to um, finish college, when I was trying mm. to be a parent, when I was trying to get into the to the job force and people were turning me around and I couldn't get a job. That scripture saved my life. Wow, that's so good. You mentioned that you have Bible verses all around you. Tell me about the power of just what's in front of you, what you're looking at all the time. Uh, what is it? Habakkuk 2, 3? Is it 2, 3? Make the vision plain. It got to be everywhere. If you don't see it, it doesn't exist. And so I have to have it everywhere. That's just how I like to operate. I got like three, four vision boards mm -hmm. in my office. I have this back here. That was the first. I don't know if they can see it from because of the Zoom, but it's the uh, Psalms 23, you know. Okay. Everybody love it. They like, where did you get that from? I just have to surround myself with it. And not because... I mean, yeah, I like to give it to the people, but that's what God wants me to do, right? Because if I surround myself with it, it automatically rolls off onto the other people, whether mm -hmm. they have that belief or not. I had one woman, she, um, and you would never know that she said, I forgot how we got into the conversation. And she was saying something about she didn't believe in God or whatever. And I say, oh, well, I'm sorry. I say, well, I guess this must bother you then. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no, it don't bother me. You know, and it, this was like after the fourth or fifth session that I never knew that she felt like that. But she'd been coming in here. She was just so comfortable and talking. Mm -hmm. and I know she can't help but see this because you sit right there. You can't help but see all of this, you know, spiritual stuff. And she was like, no, it don't bother me. I just don't believe. And she just started talking about why she didn't believe. And so then I there'll probably be a conversation we pick back up on next time, you know, because she didn't just come out after three, four sessions. Now you coming out with that. It was a reason why you came out with that. You asking for something. Mm -hmm. And I told her that just like I told you, I say, well, yeah, because I like to respect people. I don't have a problem, you know, with your beliefs or whatever. But when people open the door, I have to walk in. Yeah. I think it matters so much what's around you, what's in front of you, you know, what you consume. Right. You said earlier, and I like that you used that word earlier when we were talking about boundaries, you don't have to consume everything, mm -mm. you know, just because it's the most popular show on television or just because it came across your social media feed. You do not have to be a consumer of that and take it in. And it's really kind of like watching what you eat. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't necessarily control how something happens in your body once you eat it. Absolutely. But you can make a choice whether or not to eat it, mm -hmm. right? And so once once it goes in, it's going to do what it does. Mm -hmm. You get to decide up front, though, are you going to consume it? And I think that's so powerful. And so what we have in front of us, what we choose to give our attention to, I believe is going to become part of us. Mm -hmm. And the Bible tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? All these things that come in, they're going to find their way out. Absolutely. And one of my lead pastor says, what's down in the well is coming up in the bucket. Mm -hmm. So we got to pay attention to what we are consuming. I tell you what, this has been absolutely it has. incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I know that your clients are blessed to work with you. And we've been blessed to spend some time with you today. If people want to kind of keep up with what you're up to, how can they connect with you? Well, I'm on all social medias. Um, on my personal page is at Virginia Dale Manning, and the business page is at Jim Man Consulting. You can connect with me. You there's a way you can you know uh, opt into my newsletter, or you can go to my website to opt into the newsletter and and get some uh, a lot of tidbits of different types of things that's going on every month, and more inspiration, more tips and tools about how to manage your mental health in a healthy way. I love it. And all that information will be on the screen and in the description. Thank you. Thank you so much for the time that you spent with us and just for the wisdom that you shared. And I pray that we will all just kind of take that in, really meditate on that and allow God to speak to our hearts about how to take care of our mental health. I say all the time, we go to the doctor once a year, we go to the dentist twice a year, but we don't prioritize mental health care that same way. Absolutely. Because it is important. It is so important. 
So thank you for sharing with us and just for what you do in the community and in your career. We appreciate your time. Yes, ma'am. Y'all be blessed. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Hey, thanks so much for listening. If you want to stay up to date on what's happening in the LCF community or for more Faith First chronic diagnosis content, please visit our website at livingchronicfaith.com. And while you're there, consider registering for membership free of charge. Also, check us out on Instagram and YouTube at Living Chronic Faith. Be sure to follow and subscribe. Remember that I'm praying for you. Yes, you. And until next time, always expect great things. Talk to you soon.